Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not very often we get to sing some of the marriage hymns, and we'll see why we're doing that today. But this one is from 860 in the Lutheran service book. Gracious Savior, grant your blessing to this husband and this wife. That in peace they live together in your love throughout their life. Christ defend them from the tempter and from all that would destroy love's foundation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of grace, strengthen us as we share your word together. You betrothed, betrothed us to your Son through his blood shed on the cross. And even as Eve was drawn from the side of Adam, so you draw, drew us through the spear-pierced side of Christ the Savior, so that by his death and resurrection we might be your own, here in time and to eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in in Mark chapter 9, and let me see. I was doing my, had my Moderna vaccine yesterday, so I was going to do my last calls and all that kind of good stuff today, and then was had a little chills and all that kind of stuff, so I thought I'd, I'd hang a little bit, and so if I needed to, to cover up and put on a coat real quick, that that would be okay. So if I seem like I fall into hallucination or something, you can just you can just uh, tune to where I come back into focus. Not really, it's not that bad. But uh, so that's what's going on in my life. You know, of course, these vaccines are uh, available. I had a lovely young lady down at um, Walgreens that finished me off yesterday um, with the shot, hardly felt it and, uh, feeling a little bit today and, in, in not any severe way, but so our church, we're going to be coming back in July. We're going to switch back to nine o'clock and 10 o'clock and some of our elders are gone. So we're going to talk about the nine o'clock and, and the goal I think is going to be eight forty-five for our, our Sunday school opening and then the 10 o'clock for the service. But for that first Sunday back, of course, the 4th of July weekend, Pastor Hagen's going to be here and uh, um, likely will be a, a lot of folks traveling. So we're, we're going to just go 9 and 10 on this coming weekend. So something to look forward to. Of course, at that point, we'll, um, the, some of the, well, all of the seat markings for which service you're going to attend are going to be gone and, and uh, we can resume what is, uh, what is our our goal is to come back to normal, and, and thanks be to God for bringing us through this, this really challenging year. So we're thankful for that. We were, at, and when last we met, in verse 45, and I think that's right, if your foot causes you to sin, of chapter 9, by the way, Mark 9, verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life may, lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And then you notice it goes from 45 to 47, and it, it's not that they forgot how to count, and it's not a misprint. It is because they there was the repetition there at what would be our 46 of the phrase, with one um, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And they thought is it's that it seems because of the repetition there, that it's very possible that in a few of those manuscripts, one uh, of the rabbis that was uh, handing it down, or one of the early church fathers that was the scribe that were handing it down, that they just um, saw that and, and slipped it in there twice. So that's why it's it falls out there in verse 46. But it says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. And uh, that word is the same in verse 45 as it is here in, 
in 47, the word is actually Gehenna. So that is a, Gehenna was a valley called the Valley of Hinnom. Hopefully you can see this. That is south of Jerusalem. And the Valley of Hinnom kind of, um, because of like King Ahaz, if you look at Second Chronicles 28 verse 3, King Ahaz took his child into the valley of Hinnom and sacrificed him to the, the Canaanite false god of Molech. And that was a place apparently where, where this false idolatrous worship had crept in among God's people. And very often through the lousy kings that, that did not take seriously the importance of standing up for true doctrine and keeping oneself uh, separate from those things that aren't true and right. So King Ahaz, that's 2 Chronicles 28, verse 3. You can probably follow um, some, some of the other footnotes in your study Bible to look up and see some references to that. So that's about as bad a thing as you can imagine. Somebody taking their child and sacrificing that child to a false god and in in prayer, thinking that somehow you were going to appease a god or aggrandize the god to the degree that 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 false god is going to somehow help you, the one that you're praying to. So after after that was kind of snuffed out, I think in the time of Josiah, which would have been about like 609 in that ballpark, um, in that false idolatrous worship, this became. A, this detestable, awful valley where these terrible things happened became a place where it became a garbage dump, really. And it was said there that the fire never went out, okay? that it's that it was perpetually being burned to keep the all of the to keep all the garbage of the city of Jerusalem from piling up. So in our in our English translations, they just render it hell. But it's kind of an interesting little backstory on why that uh, Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom was described as is being described as hell because of that perpetual fire burning the garbage. I think you know. I, I think that it is also the case that people who were unclaimed that that were um, that's the right way to say it. The the people that were that died in Jerusalem that they were chucked in there and kind of burned up with the rest of it. So um, just a little, if I might make a, a little, not analogy here, but, you know, it, it is the the ultimate symbol of the depravity of a culture whenever it does not press, it does not regard as precious the lives of their young. And whenever, you know, we see it at every step with with young people in our day and age, who would just as soon not have anything to do with children, who willfully choose not to be open to the blessings that God wants to give them in their in their relationships. It also happens, certainly over the course of time as, as people are getting married, but um, it, it's we see it in, in the idea that I, I, our culture has willfully embrace the practice of the murder of our young people that is the the practice of of abortion and that is you know there's so many parallels to that practice of of king ahaz in second chronicles burning his child up in the fire is there's a deep deep sickness whenever people are too troubled are too, too bound up with what they want and the convenience of their own lives to regard as precious the life of, of a child that God's given. So here he says, it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. And the idea there is not that you were, it's it's not having one eye or two eyes that are going to make you, that are going to, that are going to make you good or bad. It is a, we, God wants us to guard our eyes, guard our hearts, and not let Satan in to tempt us and to lead us astray. So, but in the grand scheme of things, it is absolutely true. I'd rather have my eyes plucked out than, than with my eyes go straight into hell. You can see, again, a cultural leaning. And from a very young age, children are, are addicted to pornography and kind of surfing through that, that cesspool of of 
the online pornography world that devalues the gifts of, of that God gives his people. So it's, but the eyes don't make that a problem. It's the sinful human heart. Remember Jesus said in is it Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, uh, that it's out of the heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, murder, all of those things that that defile us don't come from the outside in. They come from the inside. That's what the human heart is. And for that reason, we need a savior of sinners just like we are. And we lift up our culture. Dear God, this is the condition of the hearts of our people. And we pray, we know that you can do bigger things than this. So we lift up our world and pray that God would would restore his people so that we can uh, so that we can be a a people of God and God's church can thrive in in our country. I don't want to blanketly equate the United States with the church. I'm certainly not going to do that, but where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, that comes from Isaiah 66 and it is a fearsome fearsome picture, isn't it, of the the fire that doesn't go out the worm that doesn't die, that's continually rooting and, and defiling and destroying. So uh, we talked about the asbestos fire, which is the unquenchable fire of hell last, last week. For everyone will be salted with fire. Kind of an enigmatic statement, I would say. I believe that, that the intention behind that is that sufferings and the struggles and the trials, or we would say bearing the crosses of sinful lives in a sinful world, that it has its own, it has its own capacity for, uh, if not purifying, causing us to run to the cross. Everyone will be salted with fire. God, God disciplines, Hebrews 12 says, God disciplines those whom he loves as a loving father disciplines his children. And, and God says, don't take lightly his discipline. But when you receive it, know that he regards you as a child and not as an illegitimate son or illegitimate daughter. So salt is good. Everyone will be salted with fire. Those the, the struggles. I think the early rabbis regarded that as some commentary on Leviticus 2 verse 13. I don't think so, but you know, the, the whole idea behind being the salt of the world is the church is called to be to be a preserving agent like salt and is it's spicing also in in a way we use salt to spice our to spice our foods but it's also a, something that helps keep our our food around a lot longer and preserve it so he says have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other so uh, he's not saying be salty whenever we think of that in our in our the way we use those phrases we'd say well be salty it sounds like you're a troublemaker always looking for fights with somebody. That's not, isn't the case at all. He's saying, be the salt of the earth that God intends you to be and live at peace with your neighbor so that God's kingdom can grow, right? so that we be the salt of the earth. Let me see, verse chapter 10 now. Okay, that's where, where we left off, sorry. Teaching about divorce. And those, and of course, these headlines are the English Standard Version's headlines, they are in the Greek text itself, but Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and, oh, crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. So, pr presumably, if it's across the Jordan, that it's probably, well, I'm too close to this, in, you know, in this ballpark where he's doing his teaching around the Jordan River. Crowds gathered to Jesus again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. The people came to Jesus, and he, as his custom, did not turn them away. But he, this is what he came for, because sheep were without a shepherd, and he came to be the true good shepherd. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test Jesus, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The word test, we've said it not a hundred times, but we've said it many times in this Bible study is peirazzo. And the word is the same word that we use for tempt. And I think that the Pharisees came up and in order to tempt him, asked this question, is it lawful to divorce your wife? I think the Pharisees were acting 
even if they were unaware of it at the behest of Satan in putting temptations before Christ. So don't think of Jesus in the temptations he endured only being three times in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days. Throughout his ministry, Jesus faced, faced the temptations of the devil and, and the temptations to walk away from the chosen mission that God had appointed for his son. And uh, Jesus, of course, did it. He was faithful, even to the point of death, and um, as he calls us to be. So the Pharisees tempt him because they're acting with the father of lies, Satan. And that's, you know, John 8 talks about that Satan's a liar and murderer from the beginning. He's the father of lies. And so he's using the Pharisees as his agent here. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Boy, this is these verses are when we talk about when we talk about divorce and remarriage and the contemporary situation even with respect to God's church we have to say that something is very very different in in say in in our homes and in our families than 50 75 100 years ago and uh, and that being that it is kind of commonly accepted that marriage is a disposable thing. So this is the question that they're putting to Jesus. What do you say about it? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered them, as he often did, putting it back in, in their lap, what did Moses command you? In other words, has Moses spoken to this? What did Moses say about it? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Um, in our in our language, we that's translated, I think, biblion apostasion, um, which is biblion is kind of a book of apostasy, and you know, Bible is a is a book, but um, so. It's interesting to me, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce, and that word being apostasy, because that, you you recognize that we use that word for when a child of God walks away from the faith. It's standing away from where you've been planted and firmly grounded. It's to stand away from the promises of salvation that we have in Christ. That's what we call apostasy. When the sons and daughters of Christ in, in our church or in the church at large just walk away from Christ, that is apostasy. And it's interesting to me that he describes um, the certificate of apostasy to send her away. Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of apostasy because, in a way, the rendi and this is why I read saying that beautiful hymn. You should read it next time you're in church. Read, get eight sixty out. Read it. It's a beautiful hymn, and uh, in a way, God uses the picture of Christ's church as the bride and Christ the bridegroom, and He marries His church to Himself. So whenever, whenever they ask, well, Moses permitted a man to to apostatize from his wife. Well, you see that that how precious is this gift of marriage is, that God marries us, weds us, betrothes us to himself in the waters of holy baptism and wants us to walk in that faith. If you stand away from it, you are standing outside of the life God has for you. And it is has always been so, Luther will say in his large catechism, that there is no forgiveness outside of Christ's church. Now, he's using a little tweak on something that's older than him whenever whenever Luther says that in the large catechism, because the church said it's... it's um, see, I'm having a um, COVID vaccine moment there. Um, that... That it's... Outside, outside of the church, there is no salvation. Okay, my bad. That was outside of the church, there's no salvation. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, the early church phrased it that way. But forgiveness brings salvation. So if you have no forgiveness, you've cut yourself off from the church. Well, what do we mean by that? The church is the fellowship of believers gathered around his word and his sacraments. The posture of a faithful son or daughter of Christ 
is, and it's always the work of the Holy Spirit, is receptivity. We've said it a million times. It's to be open to God giving his gifts. And if your posture toward God becomes no thank you, then you're not just despising a particular fellowship of, of believers on the corner of, of Fremont and, and Woodbriar or whatever. You, whenever you walk away from the preaching of the word and the holy sacraments, you're walking away from the life God has for you in Christ. And we pray that the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's going to keep working. You know, pray for your loved ones that have walked away and fallen away from church. The Holy Spirit's going to keep working to bring them back. And sometimes it's through hardships that the Holy Spirit does that work of calling people back to himself. So while in we think of those things as being uh, nobody wants to endure hardships, nobody wants to go through the trials and the crosses of suffering and struggle, if they cause us to come back to Christ and be saved through faith, then God, God be praised for that. And the Holy Spirit is, is doing his work as he always does. So Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, I think that this is, we recognize when God married Eve to Adam, drew him from the Adam's side just in the same way that God drew his bride, the church, from the side of the second Adam, from the side of Christ the Savior, that when God drew Adam from Eve, there was not any allowance or provision for divorce. And we recognize that in general, the law, oh, the law was not necessary. Certainly not. The, the, Adam and Eve had a law too. Don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. But the convicting, damning word of the law had no relevance to them before the fall into sin. So it was in that fall into sin that God gives his law. And I'm not saying to you that he is, he is, God is completely serious about it. Divorce is unacceptable for a child of God. But I'm also saying to you at, at the same time, so I'm not giving anybody a, a permission to kind of walk away from their marriage and think, well, it's okay because, you know, sin, I'm a sinner, everybody's a sinner, so big deal, we'll just go our own way. Not so. Repent and reconcile. That's how God wants us to live with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But this law of Moses that God gives to govern the life of his people after the fall into sin is a law that is 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 not part of what it was before the fall into sin, and it's not part of what it will be whenever we go to be with Christ in heaven. And we don't, we won't need the law to coerce us into loving with all of our heart Christ, our bridegroom there in heaven. So Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is the most obvious place. A lot of times, a lot of times people that don't think very deeply about theology will say stuff like, well, you can have same-sex marriage or, or whatever it is because the Bible doesn't, Jesus doesn't speak to that point as though you're pitting Jesus against Leviticus or Romans or 1 Corinthians or the book of Revelation. And you, you can look on it on your own, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, a good place. I think Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, Rome, uh, the last couple of chapters of, in the last chapter, I think like 15 verses toward the end, he talks about the dogs and those who are going to be cast out in the book of Revelation. Um, Leviticus, of course, Romans 1 talks about, about sexual immorality in, in both uh, a man sleeping with a woman that is not his wife and a man sleeping with a man and or a woman sleeping with a woman. And so anyway, people say, oh, Jesus never spoke to that and think that that clinches the, the argument. Jesus defined very exactly and clearly what marriage was and what was his intention. That's what he's answering here. That's the question he's answering. He's the, the question is being put before him, and he is going to define what 
God's ordered family looks like. He says, from the beginning, God made them male and female, Adam and Eve. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There, uh, you know, the so the the leaving of of each of the families of origin and coming together, God is establishing a new home, and it's God's will that those two grow together in a perfect union and and strengthen and encourage one another. And I'll say that it's a it's a, the godly man in Christ who is called by our Savior to to take the lead in the Christian home, to be the head of his home, and to do it the way Jesus did as the head of his bride. Remember Ephesians 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. God wants, the he calls the godly husband to empty himself in servant love toward the bride. And yes, that also involves actual decision-making, and it involves not only authority from God, it involves responsibility and accountability. Men don't think that you can offload, this is very convicting to me, that you can offload being God's man onto, the, onto your wife. And frankly, if you are considering marriage and your wife can't imagine submitting to you out of reverence for Christ, I think that's always a really good uh, good hint to the godly man that he's got the wrong person, right? If if a woman in Christ will not submit to the very words of Jesus and thereby submit to her husband in love, then then she's probably not the right one, right? And that's 1 Corinthians 7 talks about the, the marital union, he must belong to the Lord at the end of 1 Corinthians 7. We can't just... People fall in love. That's our kind of idea that we, we just fall in love. Well, that's that's stupid, frankly. People ought to have thoughtfulness. We make decisions and important decisions, and we need to think them through and decide what we want. As for me and my house, J Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. So if God, if you are a young person looking for a bride or husband, the first thing you ought to say is a it's a non-starter to even begin to go a different route here is he must belong, she must belong to the Lord. It's God's will and God's intention. So and that and so being a man means being a man and actually serving in love and authority and responsibility and accountability. And it is to the benefit of a wife, because a lot of situations in our culture kind of cause men to they to abrogate responsibility and to flee from their homes and let oh my wife will take care of it I'm going to go out and go fishing on Sunday morning it's I'll let it be her job she'll get them to Sunday school that is no service to a Christian wife so not only should the wife in Christ prayerfully seek out a husband who can be what God calls him to be in the home but she should prayerfully build him up. It does a wife no good to tear her husband down, and less so for a husband to tear his wife down. And can you imagine Jesus is the picture of the husband to his bride? Jesus would never tear his church down, but builds it up in love and sacrifice and service. So you probably, uh, it's maybe we don't even think about it in these kinds of terms anymore. But let's just say that it's good for a woman in Christ when her man is a godly man. And it's good for a man in Christ when his wife submits out of reverence for Christ. And none of that speaks in the least bit to the different roles. I'm not talking about who does the cooking, who mows the lawn. It has nothing to do with that. I think in any ordered relationship that is thoughtful, that the natural talents and desires and kind of giftedness will lead them in, in the directions to express, you know, within the marriage. My wife loves cooking. She reads cookbooks. It's her hobby. Should I be completely refused to cook? No, but it would be foolish for me to insist that I take over that role because I'm the head of the home. It would be very foolish. Anyway, so... But the, from the beginning, God made them male and female, right? That's God's will. 
A man will leave his father and mother and be united to the wife, and the two will become one flesh. And there are, you know, in the sexual act, there's maybe a, a kind of a a picture of that in the one flesh union that happens between a godly a, a man and a woman as it's expressed in marriage. And that's a blessed thing. And it's something that is, I think that for the the good of our young people, we are better to encourage them because so many go down the road so early. Don't put a cell phone in your kid's hand at a young age and then turn them loose because that pornography is is an acid that will burn away their mind and rewire the connections and the synapses in their brain to have a very strange and, and disordered and ungodly view of, of what sexuality is and that it's an expression of love and service between this one flesh union. But I would say this also, a man's supposed to leave his father and mother. It is a, you know, for in-laws, if you've got, a, if you've got a son or a daughter that, that are getting married, you want to, as much as it is possible to encourage your son or daughter to, they're not your first line of, of this is not the first part of your home anymore. Their, their home needs to be established. And you don't want to find yourself as an in-law or with your own child to be a distraction from two people learning to work together. Because I know this is a stereotype, but it's kind of very often you think of it in our premarital training classes and, and what have you, that they'll, they'll talk about it being primarily an issue with with kind of hen, if I can use the word, henpecked men not ready to leave the leave their own home and and kind of almost putting their moms in in competition against their own wives. That's a very foolish thing. So uh, we want to encourage the formation of godly Christian homes and be supportive of it. And I, there's probably something very uh, intelligent about the a biblical practice of people not in our day and age we need to tell our kids and talk to our kids about not trying to fall in love with somebody but to clear-headedly think through what it is they're looking for and then look for it it's like your job list or your college what do you want in your college education make a list don't settle for less than that because if you you know fall in love with a really attractive body for a girl or boy there's a good chance that eventually they're not going to have that body and you're going to have to just settle for learning to love the mind. And if it's not there, you know, if you've got a spoiled uh, princess or a spoiled prince that's trying to, to run your home and your life, then, you know, good luck to you. But it's the cross that you chose if you chose it. Jesus says, what God joined together, let man not separate. So it is not, it's, you do not have prior approval to say, we just don't get along anymore. Well, get along. Settle down and get along and try to work through it and put a you know, confession and absolution then can become the, the foundation of a good Christian home where you can learn to look and talk to each other and, and forgive each other for Christ's sake. Because what's it, uh, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving one another just as in Christ God forgave you. There's a lot of times that our forgiveness is not enough, that it's what we have received from Christ that we also share and bestow upon those around us. So, <clears throat> I don't know. We, there are important things to think about and talk about. Let God define what the family ought to be. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. Divorce is a sin against Christ the Savior. And do not go into a situation where you think, well, you know, God's going to forgive me eventually because that's how God does. And it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission or something like that. No, you don't go into it saying, well, he's going to forgive me, so I'm not going to try. I'm just going to divorce and start over with somebody else. In those circumstances, in those circumstances, in a way, there is no repentance there. You're scheming and manipulating and trying to craft your own way. And God would rather have you put your labors toward not scheming, but toward working it out with another person, being reconciled to one another and to Christ for the sake of another person. 
that said God whenever that said divorce is not the unforgivable sin and it is is always necessary to know that for whether it is for someone who's sinned against their marriage via lust or adultery or pornography or just being a jerk or whether it's divorce that there's an awful lot of ways that we sin against the institution of marriage that God's given to us and for that we run to the cross of Christ and flood his and, and flood the throne of grace with our with our cries of of mercy and and not be trying to craft your way out okay because that's not repentance at all that said Jesus is the savior of sinners Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1. And we, we, Jesus is a bigger Savior than your sins. Don't let that become an excuse for you to do what you have kind of are manipulating toward. But in, in all of your failures, even marital ones, like I make my wife mad, dear God, forgive me, and dear wife, forgive me. In all those circumstances, we run to the throne of grace for forgiveness and know God washes sins away. But repentance as a work of the Holy Spirit is, is shall we say, bear the fruit of repentance. If I, as, as Matthew 3 verse 8 says, John the Baptist says, bear the fruit of repentance. That is to say, the fruit of repentance is, is fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's not just trying to manipulate God, because you and I can't do that. So the disciples asked him about this. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery Right, there it is. It's not, it's not okay. What God has joined together, let no one tear asunder. And yet at the same time, so that's the law and you hold to it and don't, with your machinations and uh, manipulations, don't try to find a way around it. God says, don't do it. Don't get divorced. Don't get adultery, all that kind of stuff. Don't get involved with it. But at the same time, you think of 1 Corinthians, is it is it 6, verse 9 and 10, where Paul has this long list of people who have sinned against, uh, have sinned against their marriage or against, you know, it's a long list. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. And he says, at the end of it, I'm going to actually try to get it correct here. So, um, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? They will not inherit, they will not be in heaven. Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, revilers, nor swindlers, these will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying they're not going to heaven. Right? So long as I choose to walk in a posture toward God where I'm going to divorce my wife, leave my family, heck with them, I don't care about them, then I don't have faith. This, in a manner of speaking, is, is what we mean by the sin against the Holy Spirit in that it's denying the repentance the Holy Spirit works in, wants to work in a child of God. So these will not inherit the kingdom of God. But notice the next verse, and this is the only one that causes us to say, ah, oh, thanks be to God. Because the Holy Spirit does convict and bring us to repentance. That's good stuff from John 16, verse 8. He talks about the Holy Spirit will convict you with regard to sin and righteousness. And, and, uh, but he says in verse 11, such were some of you. In other words, some of you in this church were those things. Homosexuals, um, ad idolaters, adulterers, um, drunkards, swindlers. Some of you were these things. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed. That's good baptism talk. God baptizes you. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in holy baptism, God has washed his church. You didn't do it. It's a gift. 
It is a precious gift. And that's why the early church also talked about the baptismal font being the womb of the church. If the church is the bride of Christ, where does the church give birth to her children for Christ? Her womb is the baptismal font. Right? And you're going to say, well, doesn't faith have to be in there too? Of course. Of course. But faith has to be given. It's God's got his way of bestowing it. So never cease to treasure the gift of your holy baptism. And the early church was wise enough to say that the womb of the baptismal of the church is the baptismal font. And no one can have God as father who doesn't have the church as mother. Because when we baptize sons and daughters into the family of Christ, it is what Jesus says in John chapter 3. Remember that discussion with Nicodemus and Jesus turns to him and says, Unless a man is born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's how God gives you the new birth. Water and the Spirit. It is, and to the end of the age, has always been a baptismal promise that you are washed in the promises of our gracious God. And that in your holy baptism... Can you fall away from it? Even against in sinning against your marriage and stumble into sin? Absolutely. And is, is the answer then to be rebaptized? No, because God didn't fail in the first place. The answer is to repent. Return to God's first promises and lay hold of them and rejoice in them. Right? It ain't... Yes, it's really... We make it too much about what we think we can accomplish. When God wants to give his gifts... It's best to just receive them and say, thanks be to God. Jesus said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Okay, so whenever we read scripture, we will, we talk about the, the, the first sense is the, of what we hear is literal. That we take it at the words, at the words in, in which they're natural intent. We also read scripture in context of the book, but even in the larger context of scripture and, and what has God said in other places. And if there are difficult passages that are hard for us to understand, we don't make the foundation of our theology those passages as much as we understand them in terms of the rest of scripture. What does that mean here? Well, for instance, he says, it, it would sound, if you read Mark chapter 9, Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. It would sound like there is no bib biblical exception or possibility for divorce. But we know from Matthew chapter 19 and from Matthew chapter 19 and then also from 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to do that one. But in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus says the sole exception is sexual immorality. Which is very interesting because he says it is the sole exception then so i'm not saying that you read jesus against paul but paul comes along in verse 8 and says to the unmarried and widows i say that it is good for them to remain single as i am but if they cannot exercise self-control they should marry for it's better to marry than burn with passion in other words you're making a bad mistake if you're telling your kids to get college paid off before they get married because they're not living in sexual chastity. This is a, a very difficult culture to do that in. And the, the God-given mechanism for relieving those sexual desires and for building one another up and sharing something that's blessedly a gift from God, the God-given place for it is in a one man and one woman for life marriage. Okay? It's not boy, boy. It's not girl, girl. It is one man and one woman for life. Uh, then, then he goes on. Okay, I'm not going to get into verse 14. We can talk about that's a great passage, but it just so, shows how important uh, the godly spouse is in a relationship. But he says um, in verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 7, the unbelieving, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Now, we have read into those passages and understanding that Paul is saying, if my unbelieving spouse walks away from Christ, says, heck with that. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I don't believe your God. I'm going my own way. I can't bring them at gunpoint back into the marriage. 
And he says there that if they walk away, then the, then the faithful spouse is not bound. You can't change that. We call that desertion or abandonment um, is, is often a way it's described as you look through the small catechism and we talk about it. And, you know, are there other, you know, Jesus says, except the only exception is sexual immorality. Paul adds to that the, sex, the, the exception the divorce exemption for for abandonment. So we might kind of wonder, well, I mean, a lot of times kids will ask, well, what about uh, a viciously, uh, physically abusive husband or father that, uh, you know, is, is that fall in there? I would say this, um, I'm not God. I think in, I, so I don't want to create exceptions that the scripture themselves hasn't hasn't created in the two that are specifically mentioned are adultery and desertion. Um, you could make the argument, and many do, that desertion, if if you are beating the tar out of your family, that you have, your heart has been alienated and abandoned them. I'm not going to make that argument. I'm going to say for the one who is suffering under that cross, that we need to be supportive and care for them and help them to find most of all safety and protection in a community of love where they can can flood the throne of God's grace. Even in every failed marriage, in every relationship, there's going to be failure, there's going to be sin, and in every single one, we learn to walk in repentance for the parts that I know that are my own, even if they're not um, the abuse or the the physical, maybe they are, maybe they're emotional or verbal. Those are all. I'm not trying to carve out a whole new set of exceptions for divorce. I'm saying, I'm saying that that when things go bad and they go bad and they go bad, this the child of God must always flee for refuge to the cross of Christ and entrust himself or herself to God's mercy. Don't try to don't try to manipulate it and think that you can that you're not going to work hard. You're just going to do it the way you want to do it. But at the same time, if you have no if there's you know, there are those situations that that become very difficult. And my answer would be to the the grieving spouse because they grieve too would be repent, come back to the cross of Christ, and and put your hope and rejoice in Him. In, in some circumstances, there are is there's complete um, one is a completely a victim of the other. So I'm not saying that's impossible, but for the most part, um, in for the most part in all of our human relationships, we have plenty of things to to repent of. So I'm going to close there. Uh, divorce and and uh, adultery, the 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 kind of gospel thread that I suppose I'd sew this up with is, is that Jesus didn't betroth you to himself as the bride of Christ because you do a good job of it. He did, he did what he did by his death and resurrection because you and I don't do a good job of it. And yet he loved us and, and came to live and die for us so that we can be his own. So live under that grace if you struggle to be a good husband, a good wife, if you struggle to be a good parent, and and we all do, if you struggle under the burden of guilt for a failed marriage, uh, repent, run back to the cross of Christ with with bitter tears, pour out your your cries to the throne of God's grace, and then look to the cross and know Jesus is a bigger Savior than your sins. Father in heaven, we pray that you would uh, continue to strengthen and preserve your church, that you would continue to build up your people, that you would continue to, to help our homes to be a reflection of that, uh, a reflection of that more perfect union that you established when you baptized us into your family of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you and keep you keep uh, stay in touch with us. We're we're shifting gears now. We want everybody back, and and we're going to need a lot of help. I think along the way for ushering and doing all the things that we have not done for over a year now, and uh, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be back together. God be with you.